good technically morning for five more minutes, everybody. Uh, I, uh, let's, get this, uh, let's get this done and you can all uh, go off and enjoy lunch. Welcome to the last day of the conference. Uh, I am certainly, have had an amazing time, but I'm looking forward to being done as well. <laughs> Um, so, welcome to Still Don't Do What Charlie Don't Does, Making CRD Changes Safer. Uh, this is actually the sequel to another talk that I did previously, which was just called Don't Do What Charlie Don't Does, which was about API design. This one is about making API changes. So, uh, my name is Nick Young. Uh, I am a, a senior software engineer at Isovalon at Cisco. Uh, and pretty relevant, I guess, to be like, who's this guy and why is he yelling at me about CRD design? Um, so, yeah, I started looking into uh, CIDs very early on in uh, 2017 when they were still called uh, third-party resources. Um, I, uh, we were looking at using that uh, at the company I was working at at the time. Then uh, when I was uh, working on Contour, uh, I did a bunch of design work on the HTTP proxy resource, which was a replacement for another CID, the Ingress Route resource. Uh, and then I've been also been involved in Gateway API since its in inception at uh, 2019, typo. My bad. It is five years this year. It's five years next week since we started Gateway API. Um, okay, but so today is agenda. So um, uh, I need to explain a little bit about how Kubernetes stores objects and versioning for you to be able to get why a lot of these things are necessary, uh, and then walk through some CRD change mistakes using uh, my uh, poor uh, SAP Charlie Don't. Uh, as the straw man, and then uh, give you some tips on what to do to avoid them. And yes, I did choose Charlie Don't, uh, specifically because it has the letter CRD in it. Um, but why did, I, why did I come up with this stupidly complicated name for my talk? Well, you can blame The Simpsons. Uh, so in uh, The Simpsons, there's an episode where Bart gets a knife, and it has uh, the 10 do's and 500 don'ts of night safety, and that book has a section that's called Don't Do What Donnie Don't Does. Uh, and so yes, I have lifted that wholesale, Thanks to The Simpsons. Okay, so th this, with that in mind, this is Charlie Don't. Uh, Charlie uh, is unlucky enough to work on a custom controller for Kubernetes at uh, Bigco. Um, yeah, and he also has really bad luck and always makes the worst possible design decision. Uh, and so we all want to be not like Charlie. So yeah, poor Charlie. So previously on Charlie Don't, in my previous talk, uh, I covered a bunch of things about uh, API design principles. I don't have time to go into them now, but maybe some of these might be a bit clearer after this because one of the reasons you do design things in the ways that I said earlier is that, uh, yeah, to make changes easier. So, read the API Bibles, the API conventions and API changes doc. Think about how your users will use the CID, use status and status conditions. Make as many fields as possible optional with defaults if you can. Avoid maps except for labels and annotations. Use list type map is instead. Avoid bool types and bounded enums. Uh, avoid cross namespace references. Make them need a handshake if you do use them. And don't make breaking eye changes without an API version bump. Okay. So, why are API changes so important? Well, you know, software is a living thing. Uh, if you don't keep building it, it bit rots and dies. Um, you need to add no more features to uh, handle things that you don't, uh, you know, that you never thought of. Um, I always like to say, uh, you know, there's no such thing as temporary except for saying no. <laughs> um, so, saying, especially in open source, saying no is temporary, but saying yes is forever. Because once you say yes, that API is in your API and you, it is there for forever, effectively. Okay, so, but before we hear more about Charlie, let's hit some background. Now, so, the main reference for this is the uh, API changes uh, doc. It's a little hard to find, so I have put that uh, QR code up there. Um, the API changes doc is like the Bible for all of this information. It is all of everything I have in here is based on that. Um, it's a very helpful doc if you are designing APIs. I th yeah, you really need to read and internalize it. However, the reason I'm giving this talk is it is over 10,000 words long, right? So it's very long, it's very wordy. It can be hard to understand. You'll need to read it a few times, so I'm trying to give you a bit of a, a leg up here. Right, so some of this you probably know. Every Kubernetes object has a group, which is like a domain string essentially that identifies a group of API objects, a kind and a resource. The kind is basically the name of the resource, but the, uh, the name of the object. Uh, a resource is the path that you use to get to the object uh, when you're doing a HTTP call. 
and a version defines, identifies a specific schema of that resource. And versions look like v1, v1 beta 1, v1 alpha 1, v1 alpha 2, and so on. Now, the group and the version are often combined into the API version field, which is group slash version, so gateway.networking.case.io v1, or you know, celium.io v1 alpha 2, uh, which I work on a day job. <laughs> so versioning is really important, right? Like, if you don't get this right, like, you will break things, you will break your users, and you will break yourself as an API author and uh, presumably the author of a controller that also reconciles this API. So Kubernetes has three classes of object stability, alpha, beta, stable. They mean basically what you would expect. I don't want to read out all of this stuff because I put a lot of detail on here for you to take away in the takeaway slides. But like the key part is alpha is no, no guarantees. Beta is we're kind of pretty confident we got this right, but we can't quite guarantee it yet. And you know, stable is, yeah, we, we, we are confident in this API. It, is ne it will never have changes. Once something goes to stable, it can't go back. Um, yeah, and making, making a breaking API change means incrementing the API version. So if you, are, if you have a v1 alpha 1 and you make a change that's a breaking change, you have to go to v1 alpha 2. Same for v1 beta 1 to v1 beta 2. But notably, if you have a v1 object and you want to make a breaking change, guess what? You're now working on a v2 object. So now you go back to v2 alpha 1. Um, so it's really important that you get that versioning scheme right when you're designing your things because that's what people are going to expect. So every object also has a storage version. Now, some of you may have come from uh, Rob's talk uh, just before where he uh, walked through a lot of the detail about storage versions. I'm only going to talk about how it applies to CRD designers, but you should definitely uh, go and watch the recording of Rob's talk later um, about how the ways that doing storage, that storage versions can mess with you on upgrading Kubernetes and controllers. Now, so the storage version sets the version of the object schema that's persisted into the storage. Now, an object may have multiple representation, representations available, um, and the API server converts between those versions. Now, so the conversions are required sometimes uh, when, you, when there's incompatible changes between versions and when, you, and when you read a version from storage that is a different version than the one you ask for, um, or when you're writing to something and the, and the storage version has changed, and the, the new version needs to overwrite the old one. So <clears throat> Intree resources handle this, all this stuff for you. It's part of the, the contract that you get for Intree. But if you're, um, if you're running this in a CRD and you have breaking changes or like big changes, you'll need to supply a webhook to do this conversion automatically if you, can, if you want it to be done automatically. Uh, spoiler alert, I don't, like, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but running webhooks is super hard. And like, you should only do that if you really, 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 really need it for some very big reason. Running a webhook is a lot of maintenance. It's very hard to get working. I do recommend against it. OK. So this is a widget, version, a widget object. It's a CRD. Um, you can see the group and the API version, the kind, uh, up the top there. Uh, and it's a very simple thing. It just lets you set how many bar you, you're storing. I didn't, I didn't feel like coming up with something super clever here. because. Uh, so, in this case, um, this v1 alpha 2 uh, object, we want to change it so that you can store multiple bars. Uh, and so when you do that, you know, because that is a breaking change, you, you have to increment the API version. You, know, you can see at the top in the API version field, uh, this is now a v1 alpha 3 object. <clears throat> okay, so this is not a compatible change because you would need to convert this uh, to be able to, you know, there need to be a conversion between the things. Now, because this is a pluralization change, you're moving from a singular field to a pluralized field. This has actually been done a bunch of times in core Kubernetes, and so there is a well-defined process on how to do this safely. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's not compatible because you can't take this v1 alpha 3 version and transform it back into the v1 alpha 2 version, even with an automatic transform, without losing information. You know, the, the old one only let you store one bar, the 10 value, uh, and you, if you try to turn this, this object back into the old one, you would lose one of these two values. Yeah? So that's why it's an incompatible change. So <clears throat> you can write conversion code to safely convert from v1 alpha 2 to v1 alpha 3 in this case, because basically 
V1 alpha 2 has one bar, V1 alpha 3 has an arbitrary number of bars. You know, if you're converting from 2 to 3, you take that one bar and put it into the first element in the list, and you're good. Right? Like it, there's no information is lost, the schema makes sense. Okay. You can skip conversions by making compatible by making backwards compatible changes. Now, so what makes a backwards compatible change? Well, it's time for Charlie to uh, stick his face back in. So, Charlie doesn't understand the rules for API changes. Uh, he makes changes that are not backwards compatible and doesn't increment the API version. And yeah, and then users of his CIDs get screwed um, because you know, in many ways, Rob will talk about some of the ways. The API server can end up, you can end up not being able to apply the CIDs. When you read the CID, when you read the objects back, they won't read properly. Um, or you can get even more subtle bugs where fields will just disappear or change meaning or things like that. So it's really bad and you really, as an, if you are a CID author, you need to work really hard on not doing this. So what can we do? Well, it's complicated. <laughs> um, so, but there are some, some sort of rules you can stick by and I'm gonna try for the rest of this talk to sort of give you some uh, examples and rules that, that will make some of this easier. So my sort of backwards, backwards compatibility rule is this. If you can take an, an, a new version of an object with only the required field set, change the version back to the, the to version at the top back to the old version and apply it and nothing behaves differently, then any changes between those two objects are backwards compatible, right? Like basically if there's you, another, a more formal way to say this is, is if there's serialization compatibility, you can round trip the object to the new version and then back to the old version without any loss of data or change in behavior, then the, the changes are backwards compatible, right? However, like that means it's really, really, really hard to make changes that are not that are that are backwards compatible, and that is correct. It is very hard to make changes that are that are backwards compatible, and you need to be very careful. So you can make safe changes if they are additive, and you have some feature flag mechanism for uh, controllers to be able to make sure that they they know that they should be doing something different. Okay, so additive changes a special glass of changes that will break in limited ways and understandable ways, uh, you, which means things like you, you, add a you add a field uh, and then you go back, the field is lost and the, you know, that behavior just stops working, right? Like you know, if you add a new thing and then you roll back the versions and that behavior stops working, that's kind of expected, right? Like you lost access to the feature, the feature stops working. <clears throat> so. Let's try and make that a bit, I don't think that's very clear, but let's try and make it clearer with some examples. So, poor old Charlie, when he adds a new field, he makes it required, right? Like this is a breaking change, because when you add a required field, now it's required. Every record has to have that, and then when you try and put the old one in, it's missing a field. It won't apply anymore because there's a required field missing, right? So what can we do about this? Well, the best way to do this is just make the field optional, right? Like. You know, when you, you and the, the other thing is that the default value for the field needs to mean the same behavior as the old version, right? So if you add a thing that, you know, I think I've got an example in a minute, you, um, it's really important that, new, that the behavior of the object doesn't change when the new field's unset or defaulted. So you can either use a zero value or you can, add, you can set a default that is meaningful that means like do the old behavior. Right, and so if that is the case, if you don't supply uh, default values, the way default values work is if you don't fill out the field in your YAML, then the API server will fill that in for you on get. Importantly, it is on get, it's not stored, defaults are not materialized into etcd, which can lead to all sorts of craziness that I'm not gonna have time to get into today. So, so for scalar fields, fields that are strings or ints or other simple types, um, <clears throat> If you need to tell the, so you, okay, so we're making them optional, right? But if you need to tell the difference between uh, this field is set to some value, including the empty or zero value, uh, <clears throat> then you need to use a pointer, right? So a pointer lets you tell in, in the go struct. It need, lets you tell the difference between null, zero, and a number in the number case, or null, empty string, and set, a set to a string. So some examples, you know, adding a new new behavior string that defaults to the empty string, which means don't do the new behavior, right? 
or you can add a new awesomeness level string that defaults to none, which is so there's no awesomeness, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, if you want to set awesomeness, then you set the awesomeness to like, you know, uh, sum or extreme, right? But, uh, and then if you're adding a timeout field that's an int, you know, in this case, if you want zero to mean unlimited, which is pretty common in a lot of proxy implementations and stuff, unset means I don't care what it is, use whatever the default proxy value is, and the value means that specific value, right? So this is how many seconds a request should time out until a request times out. There is a very important difference between unlimited and you know, set to some very large value. And so that's a, that's a case where you need to use that tripartite value system and have it be a pointer to a string, a pointer to a, an int. <clears throat> so, um, another one that Charlie does is he uses enumerated string fields without declaring them open for changes, right? An enumerated string field is a string field that, excuse me, should open for. <clears throat> okay, so, sorry. Um, so, an enumerated string is a string field that has a set of permitted values. Usually, you do that by supplying, in Go, you supply constants for the, for the permitted values. <clears throat> but you know, if you don't make it clear in the documentation for that value that you might add more later, it's entirely reasonable for a implementation to assume that that's it, that's all the fields that are going to be there and not handle the, I don't know what this, I don't know what's in this field case, right? So, it's really, really important when you add an enumerated string field to say, hey, I'm, we might add more fields to this later. You need to handle the unknown field case by doing this. Usually that's reject processing of the object, um, set a static condition saying, hey, you put something in this field that I don't understand, uh, and you know, so that people know that their object is, isn't, is invalid in some way, but like that you need to define what that behavior is and not just panic or you know, do some other bad behavior. So, but once you do, you know, if you always document and document what happens, then then it becomes a safe change to add more values. It's still, it's still like it's a little bit backwards incompatible, in that the new values like are not going to work if you roll back to the old one. And then, but you've defined what the behavior is uh, when when there are undefined values, and so it's kind of it's still within the original API contract. <clears throat> Charlie don't uses bull fields and says, "Oh my God, I need I need not just true false. I need some other third value. I'm just going to silently change that to a string field, uh, and uh, yeah, that is very much a breaking change because you're changing the type. You know, things that are deserializing Go code from JSON will break. Um, you know, the the simple rule answer here is just don't use bull fields. You never want a bull, never ever, in because you're always going to want to add something." Basically, or, you know, the amount of times where you will end up using a bool and you will never end up being like, oh, damn it. And, you know, now I need to add another bool field for, to, to describe some other setting. You're better off, you're better off almost always having, using an enumerated string field that you have declared to be open for, <laughs> open for changes. So yeah, don't use bool fields. So like I said, use, the, use those enumerated string fields. So don't do enable awesomeness true or false, and do awesomeness level extreme, sum, or none, right? Like, you know, that, way, that way later on, if you wanna have like awesomeness level, you know, medium, then you can just add that in, right? Like, <clears throat> okay. So Charlie don't adds struct fields that aren't pointers. So for struct fields to be optional, they need to be pointers. That's just how the API works, right? Like, you can't have a struct field, you, or, sorry, pointers, or um, you can have a list of structs um, that is optional because the list can be empty, right? But so, you, but it's generally, if it's only a single struct, it needs to be, it needs to be a pointer so it can be, so it can be empty and you don't have to supply like uh, an empty object. Um, a good way to have an easily expandable struct is to use a union. Now, this is a documented API pattern, but it's not very well known, so I like, I like to always tell people about it. So, what does a union look like? So this is, uh, this is a, a slightly different version of the uh, widget object. This one has a, you can see there's, there's a union set up, so there's a type field, which is a string field that chooses which 
uh, config field you use, and then you have, at this case, at this case only one. You, you have a config field for the round type, right? So you can set the radius of the of the widget to ten, um, and you know, and you're saying this is a t this is a round widget. So you know, we're only using one at the moment, but we're about to add another one. But because we've because the type is an uh, enumerated field that we've marked as can be expanded, then again, we're all good. So if we uh, make a change here where we're adding another type, we add a, we make a compatible change where we add square as an option, and then we add a square config uh, struct that again is a pointer um, that you can set like the side length, right? So now you can say how big the square widget is or how big the, the round widget is. In this case, you know, the round config, although it's set, will always be unused because the type is square, right? Like you, you've chosen to use that one, you know, the, the, any other config things that are set will just be ignored, right? Like, so you can set them as much as you like and they're, they're useless, they don't mean anything. But it's compatible because you can still take, you, know, you can switch it back to round and pick up that config, right? So this is a really, really, really handy pattern for, I have something where I have to, you know, basically I have a ra effectively a radio button in my API, I need to choose between one type of thing and then set a bunch of parameters for the, for the thing based on the type of thing that we've picked. And adding new things then becomes a safe operation. So, <clears throat> well, I've gone a bit faster than I thought it would. Um, so, Charlie Don't makes validation rules more strict between versions. Now, I, uh, so basically, when you, it's very easy now, especially with Cell, to have validation rules that validate uh, your values on input. These are great and you should totally use them because when your, um, when your user does something that they're not allowed to do, then the value will, then the, the object will be rejected at apply time. They'll actually get a you know, try and kubectl apply and it'll be like, sorry, I can't apply that because you violated these rules, right? And part of cell is the definition of giving you an error message of what happens you know, that tells you, oh, you can't do that because you could only have one of these things or you can, you know, that needs to match this regex. You know, it needs to be a domain name. You've got some capital letters in there. Sorry, it's not going to work. Um, <clears throat> so if you have validation and you make that validation more strict, now val values that used to be okay are no longer okay. So you can't do that round trip operation and have everything still work. Right, so because um, you take a value that used to be okay in V1 Alpha 2, and you apply it to V1 Alpha 3, and it no longer fits the validation, and so it doesn't apply. Right, so that is now, so tightening validation is a breaking change. However, the opposite of operation, loosening validation, is not a breaking change. Okay, so because the value in V1 Alpha 2 will definitely apply in V1 Alpha 3. Right, it'll go back to V1 Alpha 2, no problems. So yeah, but, but importantly, and thanks Rob for reminding me of this the other day, once you loosen it, you can't go back, right? Like, you know, if you loosen your validation, you can't then turn around and tighten it back up again because that is a breaking change, right? So yeah, so let's uh, start the summing up process. So what did we learn from Charlie this time? Versioning is very, very, very important. Like it's really easy to mess this up. and. The reason why I know and the reason why I'm doing this is I have screwed this up so many times. I've made very lots and lots and lots of breaking changes that have screwed people, uh, you know, screwed users, screwed implementers, you know, don't, like I am Charlie Don't, right? Like just to be clear, right? Like I am the guy who's made all these mistakes, right? So the reason I'm trying to give you this talk is to give you all a chance to not do the stupid mistakes I did, right? So if you, if you can, the API server will convert between versions for you. So importantly, one thing that I want to make really, really clear is if you do these compatible changes, then the API server will be able to just seamlessly present the new version without you needing to write a con any conversion code at all, right? Like if you're adding new uh, pointer structs, then when you, do, when you apply the object, and the API server reads the old stored version from disk and, tr and needs to turn it into the new one, it just, it just says, oh, I've got a pointer here, there's no value for it stored, it's nil, it's empty, you know, it's optional, so I'm not printing that, that value which is optional because it's emit on empty. That's what that emit on empty in the JSON tags means. When, if you're writing this out, don't present it if there's nothing stored in there, yeah? <coughs> Yeah, changes don't need conversion if they're compatible, right? 
Now, some here, let's go over the ways I said to make changes compatible. Add new fields is optional. You know, don't do required fields. Ideally, you know, the sort of my ideal use case for a CRD is one where you can apply with spec, open bracket, open bracket, close bracket, and everything is good, right? Like, that is one of the best cases for a CRD where every single setting is optional. A lot of the time that's not really possible because there is some required field, required information you need to give. But the closer you can get to that, you know, uh, everything is optional goal, the easier it will be to make changes. Okay, when you're adding an enumerated string field, you really gotta make sure that you say, I'm gonna add more stuff to this later. Like, this is, this is an open enumeration. Don't use bool fields, just don't. Right? Like, use enumerated strings instead. Um, it's way better, and it's actually more de descriptive. It's actually easier to write your field names such that, you know, rather than saying enable awesomeness, awesomeness level, right? Like, you know, it's, it's a more descriptive and it's easier to understand for an end user, because you, you know, awesomeness level is slightly easier to understand than like how awesome is enable awesomeness, right? Like, is it some extreme, like super extreme, radical, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> um, so, and when you are making struct fields optional, make sure you do them with a pointer. And don't forget about the union type, um, it is a lifesaver. It's really, really, really useful. Um, and you know, remember about it and use it um, whenever you can. And lastly, only loosen the field validation between versions. Like, don't tighten field validation between versions. And there's probably one more sort of meta one here, which is use the newer stuff as much as you can. If you are writing a new CRD at this point in time, you should absolutely be uh, looking up cell, understanding, uh, so cell is the common expression language, and you, in your CRD definition, you can use cell expressions to perform validation for you, which you used to have to supply a webhook for, and you can do quite complex validation where you look at the value of multiple fields, you can say like, oh, if this field is set, then this field needs to be unset, or really other, other way more complicated stuff, and it's getting better and better with every Kubernetes version. So. If you are a CRD author, you really, really need to make sure that you're using cell. Okay, but Charlie, Don, and I both say thanks for listening, uh, and yeah, I'm very happy to take any questions if you have. I know I went over a lot of info pretty quickly there. Thanks very much. So what are your thoughts uh, on breaking changes as they pertain to bug fixes? So you mentioned don't make uh, validations more strict. What if you say discover that a validation is accepting things that according to say the written documentation, it shouldn't have been accepting in the first place? So that, do you still consider that a breaking change Would that still I mean, require a version bump? <clears throat> I mean, that, that's, one of those, that's one of those cases that's tough, right? Like technically, absolutely, it is a breaking change, right? Like, but. This is one of the, that's one of those cases where I would say, look, if you documented that it should be this way and you made a mistake in your regex, then you're updating the thing to, to work correctly like you said it would. Uh, and so like, I would be like, that's kind of on the border and I would not call that a breaking change. Probably some users will break, but they're the people who are doing the stuff that they shouldn't have been doing anyway, so you know, it sucks to be them, right? Like, you know, read the documentation and do what it says. Like, yeah. <laughs> Makes sense, thank you. Yeah, no worries. So I agree that the unions are quite useful, but in a way they screw the validation, right? Because uh, in the example you had, for example, you know, cannot easily set the round config or the square config as required based on the type. You can use the cell validation rules for that, but yeah, so that can you actually use for a kind of explosion of the cell validation rules. Or? Yeah, so, so yes, you can use cell to validate that if you set the type to round, you only set the round config. Uh, you absolutely can, uh, and it does mean that you end up with complicated cell val validations, but like that's one of the cases where you as the maintainer need to accept the complexity so to make the user's life easier, right? Like so the user doesn't have to remember the rules, you write down the rules, you know, and then the user does them, right? Like, uh, but you can have multiple lines, multiple instances of cell validation for each object, and so I really encourage people to do that. So in that case, there really should be a cell validation that says, if the type is square, then make sure this is, then make sure square is set and round is unset. And if the type is round, maybe, you know, I understand what you're saying that it does get complicated very quickly, uh, but the, the folks who work on cell are working really hard at making it so that cell has more um, complex function functionality and can deal with that sort of case. Thanks, this is a great point. Okay, thanks. Thanks.
Uh, so let's say that you perhaps wrote some CRUDs before attending this talk and you made some bad mistakes. What are strategies possibly, you know, to recover from those in a more, like, particularly user-friendly way? Um, I mean, the, if, you have, if you have made mistakes and you need to do breaking changes, like, you, the, the really, the best thing to do is to, is to, you know, take your medicine, say, like, yeah, look, we made mistakes, we're doing an API revision, you know, the old API will continue to work, um, you know, but we think that this API design is better, here is the new API, here is what's better about it, and here's how you migrate, right, like, you know, and it, it could be that, you know, you can't write, a, it's, you know, it, that migrating is not like you can't write a conversion webhook easily to do it, but maybe you can write a tool or something like that to help people, but like, you know, at the end of the day, in the long run, users are better served having CRD, CRDs that you can make compatible changes them, f to them for, and so like, sometimes it's better to, to say, look, I'm really sorry, we made mistakes, but the best thing we can do for you is to break you this one time, so that then we don't have we don't end up constantly breaking you in small and weird ways in the future, right? Like sometimes you've got to front load that pain and get it out of the way, uh, so that so that you're not like chipping away at people with lots of paper cuts for years and years and years. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks for the questions. That's awesome.